Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this session on aging well in Asia. Now, this is the very first Asian development uh, policy report, uh, which will look into this very important subject. And it is the very first edition this year as well. So it is really quite significant. Now, my name is Sharon Jeet Lail, and it's really a pleasure to be your host and moderator for this session. Now, this is going to be introducing, as I mentioned, the ADB's first ever report on aging populations. One in four people in Asia are going to be 60 and above by 2050. Now that is a staggering but really real statistic about the future of aging. It really reiterates the urgency of this report and the panel that's going to follow on where we will explore key dimensions of well-being at old age. And this includes health, employment, retirement, economic security, and social engagement. Now, this report was launched in a press conference just this morning where we got a lot of questions uh, from journalists. So this is quite an exciting development. To tell you more about its significance, I'd like now to introduce Aiko Kikawa, its lead author. She's a senior economist at ADB's Economic Research and Development Impact Department, and she will present to you the key highlights of this important report. Aiko san, please. Thank you, Sarah Jit, for introduction, and good afternoon to all the participants. Thank you for joining this launch seminar. So we're all aware that the regions are aging at a very rapid, uh, rapid pace, and what is going to happen is that this aging is going to shape our economy and the society. What we also know is that Asia as a region are aging in a different speed. So the countries might have a different policy challenges that goes. So with this background, what our report tries to do is to try to answer three questions. One is to look at the state of well-being of older person. Second, we look at how government have been responding to the aging of the population. Third, what can government do or others do to help us age well? So those three questions we try to answer in this presentation. There are five big key messages to this report. First, developing Asia is aging rapidly, and this reflects the region's success of the development but the region remains largely unprepared. What we see is the large vulnerabilities among older persons because they have a high burden of disease, lack of access to some essential services like health and long-term care. We also find, as I will show you, that the pension coverage remains still very low and that there's a rising case of social isolation and loneliness. Second, uh, the renewed policy agenda across the region is to ensure the well-being of older person. And what we mean by older person, it links to the four interconnected mentions that was just mentioned by Saranjit. Health, being productive, and also socially engaged, and also being economically secured. Third, our report, as I would present, find that there's a large inequality that cut across older people. And two groups particularly remains uh, vulnerable. Those are workers, older workers in informal sector, and also older women. And fourth, among all these four dimensions, we find that the health is the most important factor affecting the rest of the three. And lastly, this report really calls for the action for Asian government to step up its effort to help Asian age well. And those can be done through three-pronged approach. One is lifelong and life cycle, and also involving whole of the population. So let us quickly go through some of the uh, population, how the aging, uh, region is uh, aging. So on the left-hand side, you see that the developing Asia as a whole is aging very rapidly, as Sanjit mentioned that the aging population defined this report as those 60s and above is going to double in the next three decades. And that uh, they would constitute about a quarter of the population as you see in the orange bar. And on your right, 
you would see that the, how the gov governments in the regions are transitioning from the 10% of the share of the population going to the 20%. And you'll be surprised that some of the countries who are considered sort of young enough that can wait are also going under rapid transition, such as India or Indonesia. And what concerns us here is that most of the government in the region are undergoing this process while economy is still growing. So the fundamental challenge here is that whether the region have sufficient resources and the capacity to ensure the well-being of all the people. So if you look at some of the indicators, we find that absolute poverty has declined, but the relative poverty stays quite high among all the people, compared to the children or compared to the population as a whole. And what is more, this compensation of data on poverty does not capture some of the complexity that poverty entails. For example, intra-household transfer, those are not captured in this picture. And we all know a lot of anecdotal evidence about women, uh, older widows, not accessing internal uh, household resources. So what this report tries to do is to go beyond the poverty and look at the multidimensional factors that shapes well-being of all the people. And here are our uh, four dimensions that is uh, also shared by Sharanjit on the well-being. So what do we mean by well-being? It's a multidimensional state of well-being that is where the you know, different needs, human needs, are met. And prevailing literatures on well-being, like the happiness or the mental wealth, shows that the four dimensions matter. So those are not, do not come from uh, random things, but those are best predictors of the well-being at all days. And as I said, health is the most uh, important predictor. At the same time, we want to also be reminded that health is not, uh, health cannot be uh, health at all days. It's representative of the lifetime investment that the person makes throughout the lifetime, not just at all days. So you want to really promote a good health investment from the early onset. So how does the region fare in ensuring these four dimensions of well-being? We made an effort to collect uh, microdata of about representing about over 80% of the older person in the region. And this shows some uh, alarming sign. So about 57% of older person have at least one uh, lifestyle disease, but 40, sorry, 60% do not attend regular health checkups and about 43% of those with the physical disabilities do not have a necessary long-term care. And up to about 94 older workers are working in the informal sector, which then leads to a very low pension coverage. So our data shows that about 40% of the people do not have either social or contributory pensions. And moreover, about 16% of all the person in the region express feelings of loneliness most of the time. So with this, we send some alarm that the region is not fully prepared to embrace a growing aging population. Let's look at individual uh, element of well-being. So in terms of the health, the region had made great advancement in terms of reducing disease burden. But the remaining challenges are that uh, there are great uh, burden of disease from the lifestyle disease, such as heart disease, uh, hypertension, strokes, diabetes. So as a show, and also as shown on the chart of this side, you will see that uh, uh, these uh, comorbidities or morbidities, people having at least one lifestyle, lifestyle disease, increase quite rapidly as they age. And these NCDs can make them functionally impaired and create, create great challenges to healthy aging. And these uh, disease patterns are more pronounced among women and also among the economically disadvantaged. So as you see on the right-hand side, 
uh, women are more prone to uh, many of the lifetime, uh, lifestyle diseases. For example, in Indonesia, they are 12 percent higher and likely to have hypertension, or 11 percent more likely to have diabetes. And substantial portion of older persons do not have access, and they are largely represented in the low, low, low uh, wealth quintile, as you see in the blue and the orange bar. Another dimension of health that we really focus and want to highlight in this report is the prevalence of mental uh, disease. This shows the percentage of the people manifesting elevated depressive symptoms. And you see that on regional average, about 31% of the people are showing these symptoms. And that's quite alarming. But statistics also shows that about 2% to 3% only limited numbers are receiving treatment. And we know that these uh, depressions are not just clinical, but it's also due to the fact that they have other disease or uh, they are also undergoing economic stress. So it needs both clinical as well as other intervention, such as a community level intervention to support their uh, way out or some treatment on this mental health aspect of world wage. So in areas of health, to promote healthy aging necessitates of at least two sets of actions. One is to provide uh, health, uh, to meet a diverse health needs of all the person, especially managing and living and treating uh, non-communicable disease, and at the same time addressing mental health challenges. Second consists of promoting lifelong life health investment. So this is not just about the older person, but working with the entire population so that they'll be able to take care and also provide a healthy aging. And this would involve reducing non-communicable disease risk and also including uh, cost-effective preventive health measures such as take up and, and those are very crucial steps to achieving healthy aging. Now let us look at the second element of well-being, which is to being productive. This bar shows the labor force participation of older persons at 2021 among those late 50s to 60s. And what you see is that work and retirement patterns are quite differ by countries and also genders. Um, what's interesting is that the diamond, which is red, meaning it's a declining trend for the last 20 years, and green showing some increasing trend, meaning that for men in age 50s or late 50s, the trend across the region is broadly declining, while interestingly for women, it's increasing. And these, these you know, patterns and differences really uh, rep represent like differences in their economic development because how income effect kicks in are different across the countries depending on the income levels or institutional because the pension can have impact on how people participate or not, and also cultural norm. What this chart does not show though is that there is a wide uh, difference between formal and informal workers, and also between urban and rural workers. And it's primarily the rural and informal workers who work until old age. So let's look at these two particular group who are placed in a different circumstances when it comes to work. So let's look at first the informal uh, workers. And we see that on region in average, about 94% of the older workers are found in informal sector. And as we are not surprising, mostly in agricultural sector. And these informalities are high among older women. And they do not have access to pensions or other ways to support and work quite till late age. And you see similar pattern among um, urban workers, which is shown in the orange, with much lower labor force participation at later years compared to uh, workers in rural areas with very high participation. So then let's look at the section as uh, situation of the formal workforce. 
Here we find interesting, sort of very contrasting story that all the workers do seem to show that there is a very important uh, work capacity that is untapped in the region. So what are they? A growing share of all the workers in the formal workforce are retiring before, uh, despite the fact that they have some substantial work capacity. So we did some estimation to see who are able to work, but who are working and who are not. So this bar on the right hand side, left hand side, shows the share of the people who are deemed fit enough to work. But what you see in the orange side is the people who are not working. So you see substantial portion of the people who are not working representing about 10 to 20% for the early 60s, and also a larger, like 30% in the late 60s. And if you assume that, uh, what if the country are able to tap these untapped uh, workforces and um, see the economic contribution of it, and that's what you see, the part of the table. For countries like Korea or India, it represents about 1.5% of their GDP. And for others, 11% for Vietnam and some others. So these are sizable types, size of uh, economic uh, gain that you can expect if all the workers stay healthy and that are interested to work. So in the area of work and promoting productive work, um, the policy has to really address diverse circumstances for informal, who are mostly the like, majority, and formal workers. And in terms of informal workforce, it's particularly important that the government in the region make a very important effort to improve the working conditions of these people. And also to have access to some of the key social protection, such as pensions. And given that these, most of these workers are found in agriculture, it will be very important to promote mechanization through credit and trainings. On the other side, formal workers might be able to work and will be interested to work longer. What can we do? The most important and the uh, easy to do is to really consider uh, looking at how statutory retirement age is playing out. Is it, has it been reformed? Is it representing their health capacity to work? And is there uh, some uh, difference, gender difference, in how uh, these retirement age are set? Another important activities to consider is that to provide lifelong learning, even at the early onset of their careers, so that they'll be able to maintain and improve productivity and employability. And here, we cannot emphasize the importance of having a gradual transition from work to retirement. It's not like one stop from one to zero, but it would be very nice and good to have some gradual shift from work to retirement over the course, and this requires much more flexibility in the labor market. And we also find some effect of uh, help with the matching or that the subsidizing or uh, providing subsidy to the firm to retain and hire all the workers. Let's look at the second, third component of our well-being, which is the economic security. So what we mean by economic security is that people are having enough financial resources to pay for the anticipated consumption that is the remaining of their life. So what we did here is to come with the financial preparedness index, which evaluates how many people, uh, how much people would have close to the retirement, and to evaluate that against anticipated consumption of the lifetime. And what we find here is that about 86% of the um, older person, near retired older person in Japan, are financially prepared. How about our member states? Uh, the rate is about 73% in India, 46% uh, for PRC, and a bit lower, 58% for Korea. There is some notable gap, such as rural and urban gap for China, where urban workers are twice as much prepared than rural workers. What is also noticeable is that except for Japan, where you see noticeable bar in the yellow, which shows the public resource, the rest of the country are spending from their own private savings or incomes. So it really shows that their ample scope exists, 
for the agent to be better prepared financially for the retirement. How does the pension coverage look like in the region? So we also looked at the coverage among current old. The total is shown in the gray shaded area and also the coverage by the income uh, wealth quintile. What you see is that on average, uh, there are two types of pension, social pension, which is a contributory pension, a non-contributory pension, and the contributory pension. And what you see is that social pension, which is the yellow bar, are really uh, uh, the, the most prominent uh, form of pension, covering about 46% of the people, in, uh, as, as our data shows. And it also has some redistributive effect. You see that the coverage is higher among lower income, uh, lower wealth groups. Uh, but it, it also shows that the coverage is also significant among the uh, wealthiest group of older person. In contrast, though, the contributive pensions are something that is only available for the formal workers, government employees, or the big farm, employees of the big farm, and therefore, uh, very few uh, people of the lower income uh, uh, wealth quintile are receiving this uh, support. And our data shows about only 19% of the older person in the region have this particular type of pension. And needless to say, but we would like to stress that older women are more likely to receive social pension, but less so on the contributory pension, reflecting their lower labor force participation. So in terms of the economic security, we would like to see that the, as a part of the policy reform, it will be critical for this first this social pension, the non-social pension, the non-contributory pension, to really cover the poor. You will see that some countries not covering even the majority of the poorest income. And if the resources uh, issues, maybe they could also consider some inclusive uh, targeting method so that they can really channel uh, limited resources to cover some people who does not have contributed pension. In the meantime, contributory pension should be made open to a wider set of groups, including informal workers and women, by having more flexibility, or some country have achieved some level of coverage through introducing matching fund, where employers and the state also contribute to the pot. And beyond expanding public pension, government can also consider raising financial literacy, uh, perhaps leveraging some of the more latest uh, behavioral insight to overcome really the uh, myopism that people have, and also to leverage and encourage financial market to provide very clear and easy to understand products so they can start saving. In our last section, we look at the level of social and family engagement of older person. And we do so by looking at how family structure have changed. So in this region, we think of older person as always living in with child or multi-generational multi household. It's true, but we see that this, there will be more diversity as we, uh, the case to come. So data shows about 40 to 9% increase in the loan household or one person household, and that that can be uh, posing significant policy challenges. And this chart shows the distribution of this one person household by the income. And what is interesting is that um, this one person household, which are most particularly headed by women, could be potentially quite vulnerable. As you see that their distribution are much more geared towards poorer group, whereas for the men, interestingly, they're much more on the higher income quintile. And this change in the living arrangement is really leading to what I mentioned about uh, prevalence of isolation, where about 16% of the region, or one in six, are feeling lonely most of the time. And this change in the family structure also affects how long-term care, the essential care that all the person need at later life, are provided. In the region, about 94% of the cares are provided by families. And that might be changing with the fewer children and also less children living nearby. 
So our statistics estimate shows about 43% of the people with some physical limitation do not receive care as of this moment and that this is expected to grow more because of the fewer children and also younger people have different ideas about their responsibility towards caring for older people. So this unmet care need really need to look at uh, for the government to provide support to this informal caregiver as well as to also foster market economy, the care economy, so that there will be a growing number of other services that family can tap. So in this area, uh, as I said, uh, we, we, the report focuses on two areas uh, of policy. One is the long-term care, where we really see that the preparing, it will be critical for the government to prepare market-driven care economy, while also valuing that the family care remains an important and supporting the informal caregivers, uh, creating greater pool of formal uh, caregivers, and creating comprehensive care strategy at the national level, connecting stakeholders will be critical. And combating isolation and, uh, uh, isolation and loneliness among older persons was another key issue that is identified, which need uh, some of the actions, such as early warning, coordination with um, health workers or social workers to identify those vulnerable cases and also to work more on the physical space so that all the person are able to congregate or do some actions and also having a good transport. So it relates to the recommendation on age-friendly cities. And we also noticed a large the digital divide or they call it the silver divide and that can be addressed through better trainings and uh, making the technology more adaptable and usable to all the person. So overall, the report highlighted the challenges as well as the opportunity to enhance the four areas of well-being, pointed out priority policy actions to enhance the four elements of well-being. So these are just a, a list of um, act activities or the policies that is uh, more uh, well discussed in more detail in the report. And what we try to do in our report, which I highly encourage you to read, we try to draw many examples from different governments. So the country that have already gone through aging, Japan, Korea, Singapore, or some OECD country, the report collects very concrete examples on how government or the firm have dealt with these issues. And I would very much welcome everyone to take a look. So overall, it's, uh, the time is now really for the government to step up its effort to empower agents of all age to really plan and prepare and also set the policy environment so that they can invest in, their, uh, in the process of aging well. And here, uh, not just the government, but uh, which we mainly focus our recommendation on, but private sector has a large role to play. For example, it's the employer who create age-friendly jobs and also providing a financial product for retirement and delivering and fostering care economy. And action to prom this action to promote well-being in old age does have physical implications, but there are some measures that really can counteract. The experience from advanced economies that uh, expanded, that shows that they have expanded fiscal space by tax resource mobilization, but it can be done better by really deploying greater physical effort towards generating more revenue based on investment. And this, as this study highlighted, it's really the early investment in human capital, health, preventative health, the lifelong learning that would yield the silver dividend that can capture and would be uh, providing uh, push to the economy. So overall, it's really the early investment that we would like to really stress in this report. This early investment is a key, not only for the country that are currently facing the population aging, but also the country that are still enjoying relatively younger population to act so that they'll be able to harness silver dividend. And to leverage this full potential, it's very important that they act now 
And by doing that, Asians of all age can aspire to live well and age well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiko-san. That was really a great report. Uh, please join us here on the stage. You will be uh, coming to join us on the panel, <laughs> so please do hop on. And again, um, what a great report that is. As Aiko said, please do uh, go ahead and read it. Uh, you can uh, get it on the ADB website. There's also this document with highlights that uh, will also encapsul uh, encapsulate some of what she said there. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, for this session. And uh, that is Albert Av Park, who's the Chief Economist at the Asian Development Bank and the Director General of its Economic Research and Development Impact Department. He has more than two decades of experience as a development economist. Albert, please join us here on stage. We also have Norma Mansour, who's been the Director of the Social Wellbeing Research Center at University Malaya since 2013. She was also the Secretary of the National Economic Advisory Council in Malaysia for the Prime Minister's Department. Her research interests cover public and social policy governance and social protection. Welcome to you. And we have Philip O'Keefe, who's a professor of practice at the Business School at the University of New South Wales and director of the Aging Asia Research Hub at the Center of Excellence and Population Aging Research. He spent nearly 30 years at the World Bank based in East Asia and Pacific, as well as South Asia, Europe, and Central Asia regions. Great to have you on. And Aiko-san, yes, please do come back here on stage and join us. Uh, and as I mentioned, she's the lead author of this very important um, ADPR report that is due out just today. Now, thank you all for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to our uh, hour-long discussion, uh, and after which I hope to get questions from the audience. So uh, in order to ask your questions, you can do so via pigeonhole, and there will be a QR code that will come up that you can scan. That's the QR code right there. Do take your phones out, scan the QR code, because we'd love to get questions from you at the end of this session. I'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So please do scan that QR code if you'd like to ask some questions to our wonderful experts here on stage. Now first, let's start with a quick two minutes uh, from each of you, uh, really just an opening in terms of just how urgent this rapid rise of Asia's aging population is and just how vital is it to have a policy document like this to advise governments. Um, and we'll begin with uh, you, Pip. Why don't you give us a sense of just how important this issue is? Thank you, Sharonjit, and thank you, ICO, and thank you to ADB and the Government of Georgia for inviting me. Um, I think the urgency of this was very clear from, from ICO's presentation. Um, of course, it varies across countries, and, and countries across this region are at different stages of demographic transition, no doubt about that. You've got the very young Pacific countries and others, you've got the very old, you know, Chinas, Thailands, Koreas and others, and then you've got the kind of in-betweeners, if you like, which are the Indias, Uzbekistans and, and others. So if you just look at the pure demographics, it's, it's a different sense of urgency, and you see that with governments, that varying sense of urgency. However, for all of them, or nearly all of them, with the exception of the Pacific largely, um, when that change happens, that transition, as we saw, happens extremely quickly for everyone. 20 to 30 years, you've got that window where you go from entering ageing to being an aged society. That's extraordinarily quick by historical standards. France took 115 years to make that transition. Uh, the United States took about 70 years to make that transition. And time matters with this because all the policies that we saw take time to change. So 20 to 30 years is very short. So the speed is really crucial and makes it more urgent. The second thing is that it's happening at much lower income levels. So that adds to the urgency because the under preparation is much greater than it was in OECD countries. Um, so just one more thing, I think even for the young countries, and the question is always, if I'm a young country, I've got to worry about youth employment or a million other things, why should I worry about this now? And I think the thing is you can worry about both and be worrying about your current working age or child population, but still be having policies that will prepare you for that rapid ageing. So a lot of 
working age adults have NCDs already. Deal with that and that will help you with ageing later. A lot of uh, younger people or prime age adults are not saving and are subject to shocks and can't cope with them, but they'll be even less prepared for old age. So deal with that now, it'll also help you with later. So I think that urgency is not just about current older people, but it's the whole society of things that are urgent for them now, but will be even more pressing for the society later. Thank you for that, Pip. And of course, we will go on to talk about some of the themes you mentioned there, the need for preparing for this. Uh, and Norma, on to you about just how uh, you know, vital is this policy report at this time? Yeah, if I could continue from where Pip left, that it, will, it takes Malaysia 24 years and Thailand 20 years, uh, what took France 115 years, and Australia 74 years. So that's how quick and uh, the life expectancy that's, uh, con that is expanding and the um, birth rate that is declining um, for South Korea, for instance, shows that uh, the estimates of the 20, 20, 20 30 years ago is, is, is not accurate. The rate is even faster. The rate of uh, fertility drop yeah, is even faster. So um, there you go. I mean, even for countries who are rich, are also facing uh, some challenges. But for the emerging economies, especially in the region, I mean, Malaysia is an example, and a few other countries uh, in Southeast Asia, we are, a problem is the uh, a weak social protection. That the informal sector, I co highlighted uh, that among the 60s and older is more than 60%. But among the working population in Malaysia, for instance, the, those who are in the formal sector is about 55%. So you get about 40 to 50% uh, of the uh, workforce in the emerging uh, uh, economies who are in the informal sector. They are either self-employed or they are and now gig workers. Their income uh, might be high, but their, the savings is a problem. So our data shows that uh, savings among the uh, older populations is, is worse than the current population. Uh, but what's important is, uh, is to catch up on uh, getting the social protection uh, stronger in preparation for the ageing uh, society. Thank you. Thank you for that, Norma. And of course, we'll go on to talk about the informal sector uh, it, later on in the session as well and the challenges that, uh, uh, you know, obviously proposes. Albert, your view? Yeah, one reason I think that now is the right time to really think about policy action to address the uh, population aging challenge is that, you know, we're at a point in, in history where we've just come through some very major global uh, crises in terms of the pandemic and then uh, the inflate bout with inflation, uh, the s spikes in commodity prices, energy prices. And this has really been preoccupying many governments in the region to just cope with these, protect vulnerable groups. And in the Asian Development Outlook report that we issued earlier this month, you know, one thing we highlight is if you look at growth rates, inflation rates, they're now kind of getting back to normal. And I think governments are now turning their attention back to, well, what do we need to do looking forward in terms of more medium and long-term uh, development issues? And last year, we had a report coming from our research department which focused on Asia and the global transition to net zero, because we think climate change is also kind of an urgent area of action. I think governments are also thinking about, oh, what about those sustainable development goals uh, that we've been talking about as important uh, development objectives? Um, and I think the issuing a report on aging this year is really to say, hey, let's not forget about this, because it is actually quite urgent. It needs to be up there in the same level of debate as the other priorities. Um, and in particular, I think, we'll talk about this later, but you know, not all of the recommendations in the report are things that necessarily cost a lot of money. It's just really being a bit smarter about how we think about policy design. And the other thing that makes me feel it's very urgent to address these issues now is the indicators that you know, were presented in um, by AICO that showed that, you know, we're not actually doing well taking care of our current older uh, populations when the aging problem is not as severe. So if you look at things like, uh, you know, 40% of people are getting checkups, 60% are not in terms of healthcare, that 
40% of people have no pensions related to informality, that 43% of people with physical limitations are not getting the care needs uh, that are really necessary for them to function well in society. It's not a great scorecard, to be honest. It varies, of course, across countries, but given that we know the aging process will happen very quickly um, and is happening very quickly and already in quite a large number of our economies, um, I think now is the right time to really take these issues seriously. Absolutely. Very well said, Albert. And of course, we heard from you, Aiko-san. You very uh, elegantly presented that uh, 25 minutes uh, report. But there's so much more in that report that I urge you all to go and uh, look at and to read because it really does uh, have amazing data sets and analytics that you can learn from. Um, but now that we've gotten the, uh, the first question out of the way, and of course, we all unanimously agree that this is an urgent issue. The silver tsunami is coming. We need to address it. Uh, Norma, I'll start with you next because you head the Social Wellbeing Research Center in Malaysia, which has produced the uh, Malaysia Aging and Retirement Study, which contributed a lot of data uh, for this report, really important analysis. Uh, what elements of old age wellbeing are under threat in your country and the region? Um, I think it was also highlighted in the report, and it is common uh, uh, among countries in the region, that number one, I think, is the very basic, is the old age income security, yeah, financial insecurities among the aging population, that from our report, about 60% do not have any um, savings, as in compulsory savings that is required in the formal sector. And when we look at the savings, the majority of them has less than 2,000 ringgit which is equivalent to um, uh, 2,000 ringgit is about um, 500 uh, um, US dollars um, less and, and less in the accounts, in their savings. Yeah? So that shows a, a, a really uh, a serious uh, situation that's with the financial insecurities. Uh, secondly is the uh, health, the uh, health uh, uh, condition health status where um, about 60% are having one or two of the, uh, the three NCDs, hypertension, um, uh, diabetes, and also uh, uh, cholesterol. Yeah? So these three uh, NCDs are the main concern, and this will later uh, contribute towards uh, unhealthy aging. So you may add the years, but those are not healthy years that, that we're referring to. Now, in some countries, uh, health, I mean, in Malaysia, health is universal, but in many other countries in the region, they are not. So looking into um, health uh, securities and health insurance it is one of the reforms that, that the countries in the region can look at. Um, but in, in, in the case of Malaysia, our work is um, to talk to the government uh, uh, on the, these issues that we have uh, identified. Uh, because um, Malaysia Aging and Retirement Survey is a micro uh, uh, data, whereas we do have a cross-section survey that's conducted every th three years in the country, which is the health, uh, excuse me, uh, household income and expenditure survey. So the MAR survey do contribute or complement the cross-section survey that we have in the country, and, and that really provides evidence for the government uh, moving forward. Good to know. Now, Pip, moving on to you, um, you mentioned earlier, obviously, preparation is key. We do not want to be unprepared and suddenly be hit by this silver tsunami. So based on your broad experiences of advising governments on various dimensions of aging-related policies, what are the costs of not preparing and putting off action until it's too late? Oh, thank you. Um, Firstly, I think as we saw, all those policy areas, they're not like changing tariffs. You can change tariffs overnight in trade policy. You can change interest rates with monetary policy overnight. These are all things that take years, if not generations, to change. Both policies, systems and attitudes, mindsets, whether it's employers or society. So you've got to start early and you can't change things quickly. The three costs, welfare costs for people, so the household level, the individual level. Secondly would be the fiscal costs, and thirdly would be the broader economic costs. If you look at the welfare costs, they're fairly obvious, really, uh, if, if you ignore this. But take a couple. We saw that people are living longer. We also know they're living healthier. That's great. But the gap between those two is also growing. So 
Their longer life also has a longer period of disability or frailty at the end of life, but we don't have formal long-term care systems to deal with that problem in any of these countries, really, I would say, with the exception of Korea and some of the, the really high-end countries. So that's, that's one where we know people will suffer, just it will happen. Secondly is inequality. We saw that people become more unequal as they age. Cohorts become more unequal. Now, if that cohort gets larger and larger and it's more and more unequal, your societal inequality increases enormously and you have a lot of social tension around that. It doesn't happen in OECD countries because you have strong social protection systems. But it will and it is happening already in emerging countries because countries don't yet have those systems developed. Secondly is the fiscal costs and I think we're all pretty familiar with those, particularly people who come to annual meetings from finance ministries. Pension systems, the, the real sinners here are the pay-go defined benefit schemes and I hate to say it, civil service pension schemes. They are in some cases catastrophic fiscal risks um, and in others, a lot of fiscal pressure, even in, in reasonably well-designed systems. Secondly is healthcare, very hospital-centric systems in many of the countries, which leads to inefficient care um, and just high-cost care that isn't necessarily suited to the non-communicable disease burden that we saw of, of the population. And the third is just generally revenue mo mobilisation, as Ico mentioned. You've got a lot of these countries who are entering ageing who have total revenue of 12 or 14 per cent of GDP. It's just not enough to cope with ageing when you have more pensions, more healthcare, more long-term care. You will not be able to do it <laughs> unless you mobilise revenue, and that means new sources of revenue, whether it's property taxes, carbon taxes, financial transactions taxes, and reallocation revenues in existing. Finally, on the economic costs, we know that nearly all these countries um, have had or have still quite a tailwind to their growth from demography, the labour side, the growing uh, workforce. Um, and that's going to disappear. For some of them, it's already disappeared and it's going away. So that's we know that will happen just kind of in growth composition terms, but you can do things about it. You can do it by adjusting the balance between capital and labour. Um, you can mitigate it in, in various other ways, but particularly by investing in the human capital. If you're going to have fewer workers, they need to be better quality workers and they need to be better prepared across their life, as Ico was saying. Thank you for that, Pip. And, and yes, that completely underscores the need to prepare early because there's so many things to factor in. And as you say, it's a generational issue. And moving on to Albert. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, governments are finally focusing on this now because they put behind them all these issues around financial crises that we've just emerged from, such as the pandemic and others. But how can we get governments now to prioritize something like this when at the same time they're dealing with you know, what we've heard from uh, in terms of high inflation, uh, investing in infrastructure, investing in climate change policies, which we're also hearing a lot about at this uh, annual meeting. Um, how can governments uh, reconcile this with all the other competing fiscal policy measures that they need to put into place? It's not an easy question to uh, address, uh, but I think the, the, uh, the starting point is that there are many things you can do which aren't that expensive, and so there's no real trade-off necessarily with other goals. And I was thinking in these different areas of well-being that we've identified. So for instance, in health, you know, having good preventive care with checkups actually will save you money, even within the healthcare system, because it will avoid more acute problems later on that will cost more. Um, and then in terms of employment, you know, things like making pension programs, uh, getting rid of incentives to, that would make people want to retire earlier, uh, making uh, is the policies or the contracts more flexible to allow more flexible work arrangements late in life. These don't cost a lot of money. They, they do require some attention and thinking about how implementation would work and rolling out these programs. Um, and then in terms of income support, which is, I think, really a critical area, um, there's a recommendation in the report that, you know, to try to automate some of the parameters of pension benefits based on the current um, demographic realities and budget realities so that the system is more financially sustainable 
I think that's a very sensible recommendation. Also, trying to promote financial literacy, trying to uh, digitalize uh, social insurance uh, programs that can help to better target benefits to poor people and also promote things like automatic enrollments in various schemes that will improve coverage. Those are not that expensive. They're, they're very high return investments. Um, and elderly care, you know, low cost community interventions to just promote better social interaction, et cetera. Okay, but nonetheless, you know, it will be expensive to improve the basic uh, government programs in the areas of healthcare insurance, uh, pension insurance, and long-term care if the government is gonna play more active roles. And, um, you know, we really advocate for governments in the region to really consciously try to mobilize more domestic resources so that these fiscal constraints are not so binding. And we know that revenue to GDP ratios in the regions are still below advanced country levels. So there is some scope to do that. Um, the reality is governments will have to, at the end, still make trade-offs. And um, one way for things like social pensions, I think you can think about the level of targeting, whether you want to uh, focus on at least the poorest groups first, when you can afford it, and then think about how that works first and then maybe gradually expand. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's the reality, uh, that's the policymaker's uh, burden is to, to make these decisions and make these trade-offs. Um, I think as Pip pointed out, uh, if we don't support the well-being of elderly, it will really contribute a lot to the inequality in our society. So the SDG goals of uh, inclusivity and reducing inequality and also ADB's own strategic priorities on poverty and inequality reduction are also you know, met by putting a high priority on uh, elderly well-being. Thank you for that, and really underscores the importance of um, supporting this. Now, Aiko-san, um, your report uh, really underscores the need for Asians to work longer, and it's very interesting because the country uh, I'm from, Singapore, has just raised its retirement age and its re-employment age uh, yet again. It's been progressively doing this over a matter, of year, a matter of years, and I'm sure many other countries in the region are doing likewise. Um, so what can governments do to support workers uh, to work longer? Thank you for that question. So in my presentation, I touched on two things. One is to extend or make flexible the retirement age, the, precisely the one that you mentioned, and also make this work to transition more you know, gradual, or that the worker can uh, plan how they will be uh, gradually retiring from uh, full-time work to part-time work. So there are a few other things that the government can also do. And one is to uh, you know, work with a firm or encourage firm to consider its uh, uh, seniority-based uh, job promotions or the wage system. So this is really preventing, uh, incentivizing all the uh, firm to, you know, leave, let go all the workers. They're too expensive, not meeting the productivity that the wage is uh, provided for. So uh, some of the governments, as we see in the report, are actually working and providing subsidies for the firm so they can reorganize their human uh, resource, uh, resources and the management system. And that seems to work. And report also have some of the uh, experience. For example, in Japan, they introduced a system called post-off. So once a person becomes like 50 or 60, they would be compulsory <laughs> retiring from that post. Um, and so that, that they would be working as a rank and file till they would reach the retirement age. In our report, we don't say that this is the best recommendation because it did dis incentivize all the workers. And also the culture of Asia is that it's very difficult to work under your boss, you know, telling your boss what to do. So it involves both cultural as well as the institutional change and that they make the wage and the retirement, uh, sorry, the compensation system up par with the productivity of the workforce. So there are some good examples there. And others include, for example, uh, countering or doing more about the ageism. I think many countries have done quite a bit in terms of addressing a gender gap in the labor market, like prohibiting gender-specific 
uh, job advertis ad advertisement, for example. But you see in this region quite a lot of people saying, you know, age 60 only, or young workers, age this, uh, you know, uh, for in you know, job advertisement. It could be as simple as that, not costing a lot, but to ensure that there's no age-related discrimination, but people will be hired and retained based on their performance and the productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Aiko-san. Now, uh, it's really interesting because, uh, again, you know, it may not cost very much to put in place a lot of these policies, but there's potential political controversy around this. And again, I, I move to you, Pip, because we know that in many aging Asian countries, uh, policy makers clearly recognize this as an urgent need. Uh, they need to reform uh, pension systems, but that can be uh, very you know, politically sensitive, the strong political uh, opposition against reforming uh, pensions. So in your view, how can policymakers uh, move pension reform forward uh, against the backdrop of that sort of challenge? Um, well, I think pension reform is, <laughs> as we all know from our own countries, is one of the trickiest areas of policy reform of all, whether you look at France or Greece or wherever you look in the world. Because um, it always seems like a broken promise basically, in some kind of fracture in the social contract more fundamentally. So it goes beyond just the pensions themselves. It's about the state and the citizen. Um, the first thing is I think communication needs to be a lot better. Governments often leave... With pension reform, they often fail to communicate it well at all. Some of that should come well ahead of the reform itself. For example, just basic information. Most people underestimate their own longevity by about five years. So they're not thinking, they think I'll live to a similar age to my parents, maybe a bit older, whatever. So putting some facts and figures out there to say the world's changing, so other things change too. Second is how you message pension reform. It's too often message as we've got a fiscal crisis, we need to save money and you're the generation who's going to be, you know, help us do this kind of thing. Bad luck. Um, whereas in fact, a lot of the time, particularly in emerging countries, it's about fairness. Fairness between informal and formal workers. Fairness between men and women. Fairness between uh, generations. So I think the way you message pension reform is crucial. And it's not lying to the population. You saw the figures. It's about fairness. If 80% or in India, 90% of the population don't have a decent pension, then reforming civil service pensions becomes a lot more sensible. Um, so messaging is one. Um, bundling is the other. When you do a difficult pension reform, try and put some, some sugar in there too. Reform care reform, uh, bring in a social pension, things like that as a kind of grand bargain. And so a lot of it's about packaging and policy and communication. Second is that um, the automatic stabilisers that, that Albert mentioned, adjusting retirement age automatically to increase in longevity. Most OECD countries are already doing that. You mentioned that Singapore, I think, has, has introduced that. Um, that takes the political heat out of things. It's not one party or another party. It's the system. It's in legislation. It just happens. Um, and there are other ways of doing that, fiscal balancing mechanisms. And like some of your countries have notional defined contribution systems in pensions that do that um, automatically. The next is start early and, and go gradually. Try to avoid the big bang pension reform, and Mr. Macron would probably agree with this, I think, in France at the moment. Um, you know, if you get to a situation where you suddenly have to raise retirement age by five years, as we saw in some former Soviet countries after the collapse, um, that's not going to go down well. Do it gradually. OECD typically it's three months, six months, a year, etc. With with that. And the final thing I think that Albert mentioned is choice and incentives. Ultimately, the goal should be not to have a retirement age. Sweden doesn't have one. A number of OECD countries are moving to the point where they do not have a mandatory retirement age, and it becomes about choice and incentives. Retire early if you like, but the consequences of that will be lower income in your old age. Retire later, and we love you, and you'll, you'll have more income in your old age, and give incentives to do that and disincentives to do the others. But don't necessarily mandate, but use nudges and behavioural things to, to, to encourage people rather than feel like you're forcing them. Thank you for that, Pip, and, and really well said, because, uh, you know, particularly this notion around fairness uh, that... It needs to be fair. And of course, we know one area that is still implicitly 
incredibly unfair is gender discrimination. And the fact is there's a double whammy here in Aiko's report uh, emphasizing that women, and particularly older women, are the ones who are particularly vulnerable and seem to be, you know, in, in those very alarming statistics. Um, of course, this is because of, an, on average, women live longer, but they're more susceptible to diseases, as the report suggested. Um, they also take on most of the caring responsibilities. They have shorter uh, formal working lives, hence less savings at retirement. Um, so Norma, um, looking to you, what are the current efforts to promote gender equity moving forward? Um, and are they moving quickly enough to really support the well-being of older women? No, we are not. We are not moving fast enough, yeah? So you can imagine that um, uh, you know labor force participation, as I mentioned earlier, in Malaysia is about it's one of, we we have one of the lowest in the region, about 55 percent, and they won't stay um, as they grow older. Then the the rate is even lower. Yeah. So uh, because of that, then the contributory uh, uh, pension or or the mandatory pension, which is required in the formal sector, is not uh, they they've left. And, and that would uh, shorten the uh, contribution and therefore contribute to less savings, yeah? So, um, and uh, what, what ought to happen is that the, uh, to look at the impediments that why women are leaving the labor force early or why are they not participating? And by removing the impediments, the estimate is that it can bring about a 30% higher uh, uh, income uh, G GDP per capita for the country, for Malaysia. Uh, as an example. So um, promoting gender equity is one of the way uh, going forward, but as you've mentioned, that the responsibility for caring, uh, both for the young and also for older persons, older parents fall onto women as well. So having social work as, as a sector or, or the promoting a, a fairer uh, and inclusive care economy w w will be the way to support women getting into the uh, uh, workforce. So uh, if women can access or having enough uh, uh, financial capacity for them to, to purchase uh, care in the market would enable them to contribute to the economy. So I would say that uh, uh, in terms of productivity, promoting uh, economic growth and all that, investing in social protection or looking at uh, um, a stronger social protection, especially for women, would encourage them to uh, join the workforce and, def and that would in turn increase the producti productivity level in the economy. Thank you. That's right, and that echoes Ico's report as well about the silver dividend. Yes, if we get older workers back into the economy, it will lead to uh, growth, economic growth. Um, now, uh, Ico san speaking of which, uh, you know, that report is, is incredible in, in so many of its insights, but could you also briefly discuss the, the role of research and data and the kind of pivotal role it played in coming up with this report? Right. Thank you for that question. So, you know, the data are essential to providing, you know, evidence to the policy-making process. As in, in understanding the state of well-being of older person, we have actually struggled. And what we saw presented here is about nine countries who had micro data on older person. And we cannot stress this enough, the importance of having this micro data, which not only look at the older person, but the pre-older person. Do we know what is their disease pattern? Do we know how much savings do they have? What do they expect about the later life? Uh, how are they feeling about their work? So um, nine countries so far, we have seen that in our member country have such uh, uh, data, and ADB has actually been supported for that. So uh, with the collaboration with the NOMA Center, for example, we have supported the Malaysian Aging Survey. We have also supported one in Indonesia and also upcoming for Bangladesh. So we feel that this would help country formulate essential services such as pensions, long-term long -term care need, their health services. It would be critical to do that and we'll be uh, ready to support if any countries are interested to do that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, the policy report also goes into uh, a lot of the policy fixes to mitigate all the challenges that we've been talking about so far. So let's go to the next bit of our conversation. And I realize I do have lots of questions on pigeonhole, so thank you all who've uh, submitted questions. I will get to them shortly. But let's look at some of the policy fixes 
that are working. Um, and I, I look at you, Albert, in terms of what the ADB is doing to support governments to reform health, labor, uh, pensions, and other policies aimed at an aging population. Could you give us some examples of what the ADB has done so far to help uh, move along these policies? Sure. Uh, ADB is very active in supporting governments and addressing different dimensions of the policy challenges of uh, aging. Um, and I think the goal of releasing this report also is to push the discussion of these issues further across more of our uh, developing member countries. And launching in at this event to where there's a lot of government people in the room is also uh, for that purpose, because we hope that this will be an expanding, we'll, I'm very confident it will be an expanding area of our business going forward because the region continues to age. Um, so at ADB, at a project level, uh, both technical assistance and loans, a lot of the work um, that affects older people goes through our human and social development sector group. And so they do interventions in healthcare, um, also in social protection systems, which have great relevance for aging. And one example is Bangladesh, where on the healthcare side, we have a urban um, primary care project, which is really focused on, in particular, uh, increasing access of poor urban households to primary healthcare services. And that, that of course, has great relevance for um, older people uh, in informal sectors. And then also in Bangladesh, we have a study looking at the distribution of old age uh, subsidies uh, that are a program of the, Bangla uh, of the Bangladesh uh, government, but there's some evidence from our surveys that suggest that there's still a lot of poor elderly who are not getting those benefits, either they're not applying for those benefits or for other reasons are, are not uh, receiving them. Um, so that's another area where we're supporting and then uh, other direct kind of projects we have that address elderly issues. One is in some of our policy-based lending where we uh, provide budgetary support for governments in exchange in some sense, <laughs> or on the condition that governments implement some types of policy reforms that are important, we do support uh, pension reform as one aspect of those policy reforms. And then, um, in China, we've had a very focused program on aging. It's one of the pillars of our country partnership strategy. And we've particular focused on community care issues for the elderly. And more recently, um, we have a uh, technical assistance project on innovative community-based long-term care systems and services, um, which is going to focus, I think, uh, initially on Indonesia, Mongolia, and Sri Lanka also as um, countries to uh, support the development of stronger community-based systems to provide this long-term care, which as Pitt mentioned is still really at an earlier stage. And that builds on the experience I think we've had in China, which has been pretty successful uh, for some years under our partnership strategy with them. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. I think those Sounds are... Sounds like a long list. <laughs> I'm sure it's much longer. But great to see that the, there are policies uh, that are being put in place that will help mitigate some of the challenges that we've been talking about in this session. Uh, Norma, uh, moving on to you, what are some of the actions taken by your research centre and by the Malaysian government to help with uh, older Malaysians? And also, what are some of the policies that you've seen that are working in the, the region? Um, and we using Mars, using the, the evidence from Mars, we try to work along three main areas. Uh, um, first is to share with the public uh, and also policymakers the findings. Um, because as Aiko mentioned, this not only looking at 60 years and older, but also from 40 years old, that's where we uh, uh, our cutoff uh, uh, for the survey. Yeah? So, and, and we track them. So it is not just uh, uh, um, uh, one year, but it's longitudinal. Uh, um, well, the first wave was uh, completed in 2019 and 2021, and we're doing the next one uh, end of the year. So we track the same person to see whether are they healthy, if their health, health conditions uh, uh, persist, or their income security is better or worse. 
So you can see the trend by looking at this panel data, uh, micro panel data. So the, the, first we, we, uh, the, the first area that we work on is to have a round table and a town hall uh, to share with the policymakers. And we do get invitations to talk to them and they use our data from the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economy, uh, the World Bank led by uh, PIP is looking at the national blueprint for Malaysia for aging. Um, and the Ministry of uh, Women. So these are the, the policymakers who are working with us, uh, uh, getting us to uh, using mass and evidence to share, uh, uh, to look into the reforms uh, that we can do for Malaysia. And uh, the second uh, um, uh, agenda or the, the, the second line of work that, that we do is to, um, to support, the Malaysian government has tasked uh, our center to look into the effectiveness of social security and to recommend uh, uh, on reforms to strengthen social protection. So um, we are looking into that as well and Mars is also used as, as the evidence. And thirdly, we are also sharing our data with the scientific community, not just in Malaysia, but also globally. So um, the micro data that Mars, uh, uh, of, uh, the likes of Mars, there are more than 50 other databases globally uh, and we're linked through this group called the Gateway to Global Aging. So the scientific community can support the government efforts in terms of coming up with uh, innovation, social policy innovations that we're hoping the scientific community to help as well. And I think in the region, uh, uh, there are a lot of efforts in trying to improve social protection. And recently, we, we had a, a, a seminar on strengthening social protection, a workshop. Uh, in trying to support the governments in the region on uh, uh, creating or coming up, uh, um, designing better policies uh, to support the aging population. And thanks for that. And again, it totally underscores the importance of data and data is king when it comes to being able to come up with good policy. Uh, now, Pip, earlier we talked about the, uh, the many risks of not preparing in time for, for these policies. So can you share some successes and the, you know, in terms of the importance of preparing early for such policies? Um, sure, let me give three, three examples. Um, and let me say first that sometimes we say these are aging policies. In fact, often they're just good policy anyway. And I think that that's really important to stress. First one is Singapore, your own, your own country. Um, and we talk a lot about lifelong learning, uh, ICO stressed it, but I would say this is an area of public policy where the gap between rhetoric and action is probably amongst the largest of any policy area. A lot of talk about it and very little is done. Singapore has a scheme called the, the Skills Future Scheme, where every Singaporean at age 25 gets a deposit in into an individual credit that can be used for skills training and upgrading throughout their working life. They get a second deposit at age 40, and depending on their situation, if they're poor or other things, they may get more money put into that individual account. So this is explicitly kind of stimulating the market for that lifelong learning in Singapore. The other thing that they do by the accreditation process of the trainers is they're emphasising the skills that they want Singapore in future to develop green skills, digital skills, care economy skills, etc. So it's a nice kind of structural thing in the economy, but it's also very good for an ageing society. So that's one. So you can do a big tick there I for your definitely feel home country that. On, on that one. <laughs> um, second one is one that probably all of you know, and, and it's in the health sector, is Thailand. Um, we've talked a lot about how the system needs to reorient to primary care. I think in many of our countries, we know that people go straight to hospital when they want care, even if it's the most basic form of care a lot of the time. And you say, why? They say, because the doctor or the nurse at the local level just is useless or there are no drugs there or whatever. There's a million reasons why, but they go straight to the hospital. They get over-treated, they get expensively treated, it's extremely inefficient. Thailand recognised this problem probably earlier than most. In the late 70s, really did a push to primary care and public health, preventive care and the like, including child nutrition, clean water, etc. And they reoriented their spending away from hospitals, secondary and tertiary, to the primary sector, all kinds of things that they did. But they started really early and they've sustained it very well. What they've then added to that in the last few years is a, an element of that basic package which 
provides home-based and community-based care for ageing. So the ties, I think, are built on that platform that they, they started early and have are now adding bits to it that particularly um, tune it for, for an ageing society, and they are an ageing society. The third is pensions. This wasn't introduced with ageing in mind necessarily, or an ageing society in mind, uh, and that's my own country, Australia and our neighbour, New Zealand. Well, they, they, we would say our little brother, New Zealand, and New Zealanders would say not our little brother, but um, both of those countries, they're amongst the few in the world that never had an earnings-related pension. Our basic pension scheme for most people has always been general revenues financed from the early 20th century. We never had a social insurance scheme. Um, now, as it turns out, this is great for an ageing society because we know that with social insurance schemes, as your workforce shrinks, your elderly population gets older, the financing of that becomes more and more difficult and needs more and more subsidies from the budget anyway. So that system design turned out to be really good for an ageing society. What they then did in the 80s, and this was when Australia still had about 7% or 10% elderly, um, was introduce a contributory pillar over that, which then ensures adequacy. So the basic subsistence was assured for everyone, um, and then it became more generous as a result of individual savings. So I think they kind of did it the reverse way to many countries, which started with the insurance and then worried about other things later. And I think it wasn't done with, a, with an ageing society in mind, but it turned out to be a design that was very suitable. It turns out by default to be a design that countries like Japan, which were social insurance based, are doing by default. Half the basic pension in Japan is financed from sales tax. Um, now, not from contributions. And Germany is the same. More and more countries are, are, are moving in that direction. So the whole financing of, of pensions, I think, will, will shift and will fundamentally have to change. Now, I'm going to skip ahead here because we are running out of time and I've noticed there's lots of great questions on pigeonhole. Uh, so let's just pick up on one or two questions before I ask you all my final question. Um, and that is uh, to pinpoint the most vital reform priority that you see, uh, the one thing that you could name to help Asians age well. But before I go to that, let's go to these questions now. Uh, there's two questions with three votes. Uh, one of them, I think you've already answered, Pip. This is, can you name any poster child countries where old age well-being system is working well? You mentioned my own country, Singapore. You mentioned Thailand. Does anybody else want to pick up on other countries that are working well with this? Maybe not in Asia, but uh, Denmark and Netherlands are yeah. consistently at the top of the pile when they look at elderly, you know, the Nordic. Now, of course, Nordic countries also have 50% of GDP as their revenue base, so it's a very different world. But, but certainly when you look at, you know, global benchmarks, indices, etc., they come out fairly consistently high, um, as do Australia, New Zealand, Israel, and a few others. Good to know. Uh, the other question that's had three votes is uh, to develop an effective long-term care strategy, um, which stakeholders should be brought around the table? I think we know, certainly all of you are stakeholders that have been brought around the table, but who else? Norma. I think the, the government is the first uh, um, stakeholder that should come on board because policies can nudge behaviours, yeah, even for private sector, for, for uh, um, the uh, business to, to take up. So uh, definitely, uh, um, the Ministry of uh, Health, yeah, uh, from the government, it should be from the Ministry of uh, Health, Ministry of uh, Economy, if you have the economic ministry in your country, um, and also um, the... Um, uh, finance, economy, and the, uh, in our case, the Ministry of Women, yeah, Women, Family and Development, and in some countries, it's the Ministry of, Ministry of Welfare. So I think the state will have to play the role first. So these are the key stakeholders, and, um, and to come up with policies that will also enable, because um, I'm talking about my own country as an example, that uh, to promote the care economy, because um, until and unless you are uh, able to support now, social work, for instance, in a country like Malaysia is not, um, we don't even have an act to professionalize 
social services. Yeah? So, um, and therefore, we don't have enough uh, um, individuals or enough people getting to uh, support the older people. So the hence, women have to stay back and, and, and uh, uh, care for their, uh, their older parents. So having in place the legislation, yeah, having a, uh, uh, would support uh, um, the, the care economy where uh, more people are encouraged to, to, be, to be social workers because they are, the compensation is the same as nurses, for instance. So this will be a good start. Um, so these are the, some of the eight things that I think uh, um, a government can, can, can do in order to, uh, to bring about a, a better long-term care for the aging. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. And actually, I think this one might be specific to you as well, because there's a question here, uh, two votes for this question. Uh, since economic disparity between men and women is quite jarring, and of course, women are also more prone to disease in old age, do you think there is a need for gender-specific social security schemes? Actually, aiko -san, I wonder if you could address this, because you do mention uh, this in the report. So uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, not precise uh, that, but what we noticed is that first the pension has different retirement age in some countries, and particularly prone in these regions, that the women about five years younger in the set of the retirement age, and that put them into condition where they have less contributory years, but longer years that they have to depend on pension. So that's something that they can really you know, consider. And uh, secondly, there is an issue of the uh, widow payment or that uh, also survivor pensions. There are many designs that is not really allowing full access of the women and also the widow to have inherit the, uh, what her portion of the pension should have been. So there, there has been a greater, there should be a greater effort to really ensure that because it's usually the widows who we see as a particularly vulnerable groups in the, in the data. Norma? Could I add? Could I add that I, I thought uh, South Korea is doing uh, a, you know, something that we can learn from in this regard because not only that older persons receive pensions, but you will also get a care allowance where if you're caring for an older person, uh, uh, you will receive the allowance. So that will help uh, um, support or complement the income that perhaps because you take less time at work or you reduce the time uh, um, at work and, and reduce salary, that can be compensated or complemented by the um, care allowance that you receive from the government. So I think that that's another way which is quite not gender specific. I mean, it could also be for men, uh, but in that, in that case, you are supporting uh, the long-term care that the aging population needs. Yeah. Thank you for that. We do have a lot more questions on the pigeonhole, and I do thank everyone who's contributed. You can come to our panelists afterwards to ask those specific questions, but we're running out of time. So I do want to end with this final question, which is, again, what is the one vital reform policy that you would recommend to help us all age well? Pip, let's begin with you. Mine's not a policy, it's a mindset. Um, this, and Andrew Scott and others from London Business School talk a lot about this. The three stages of life, you get educated, you work, you retire. They're all very distinct in the way we've looked at things. We have to change that thinking. Education will probably stay the same in the young, young side of things. But working life is not about finishing your school or university and then you know, working till you're, it'll be 80 or 90 in the future uh, with that, that as your base. You know, education, work will need to interchange. At the end of working life, as Ike mentioned, retirement and work will need to interact with one another much more flexibly. So that three-stage life that we've lived with, that our parents live with, that our grandparents live with, that's going to have to become much more nuanced and much more um, intertwined throughout the stages of life, including with education, more practical exposure to what the workplace will involve. So it's, you know, th that rigid kind of holy trinity has to become like the Hindu deities or something, <laughs> many more of them. Yeah. Thanks for that. And actually, I'll go right to the end to Aiko-san now, because obviously you were the lead author in this report, so there are many policies that uh, you are recommending to deal with the challenges. What is the one vital reform policy that you see uh, that goes beyond all else? 
Thank you for that question. Not meaning to sell our report, but I do have to sell our report. We find that some countries do better in one element of well-being than others. Health, uh, work, uh, economic security, and social engagement. We en really encourage countries to look at where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are, and we need to work on where they're falling and to invest in there so that you have uh, holistic uh, well-being being uh, built. One would depend on others, others would depend on others. So these are the four trinity, or not what do you call it if it's four, but then it's really important to really review it against this four diagram to see which area that your country would need focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Albert, your thoughts of the one thing that you would recommend above all else? Right. I don't think Pip or Aiko really answered the question. They didn't really pick a policy. So I'm going to pick one, and that's Thank social you. pensions. Because I feel like to deal with this immediate vulnerability and address the reality of informality, uh, this is a really key type of policy area. And also, you know, we learned a lot about uh, social protection systems during the pandemic and how to improve them and how to reach different groups. So there's opportunity as well, I think, to make a real improvement there. I've done some research on China's uh, rollout of their rural social pension scheme and you know, found that it was very impactful. Other research has also found, even though the scheme didn't give people a lot of money, it put the money you know, in the hands of older people. So within the household, they seem to be treated better, uh, more medical expenditures spent on them, uh, they uh, felt happier. All these things flew out of a fairly modest but fairly broad-based uh, pension scheme. So it convinced me that this could be really important for improving well-being for, for the poor, older people. Thank you for that. And Norma, finally, your Challenge last it, word. yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Albert. Yeah, coming from a country where only 4% of the older population receive um, old age pension or social pension, I would say that would be the first line of defense. That is tax-funded social pension should be rolled out uh, uh, to every Malaysian, uh, you know, Malaysians first uh, in this case. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that's very important, uh, uh, having that old age, ba uh, old age basic security, yeah? Uh, but I also would like to take this opportunity to thank the ADB for highlighting this in their report and congratulate Aiko and her team uh, uh, for the report and for supporting uh, the Malaysia Aging Retirement Survey because I think from the evidence that we get, it clearly shows that we need to really work on our uh, um, social security uh, for old age, uh, for, for the aging population. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, well said. And once again, uh, this is the report. These are the highlights. You can get a hold of this. Aging Well in Asia, the very first Asian Development Policy Report, the first edition, and it's focused on aging well. So this is wonderful. A big round of applause to our panelists. And uh, again, as, as President Massa says in the foreword of that report, uh, despite the considerable economic and social progress in reducing poverty amongst all the people, uh, the rapid expansion of the aging demographic really demands proactive and tailored policies to ensure they age well. And I hope that's something we've managed to communicate in this panel. Thank you all for your participation and, and thank you audience for those great questions.